You are now tuning in to the Mind Body Podcast, where fitness experts and life coaches share their secrets on taking your mind and your body to the absolute best. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Get ready and take notes as we expose the raw truth behind achieving amazing natural physique and strength and ultimately become a stronger version of yourself. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the Mind Body Podcast. I'm your host Lidor Dayan and today I had the honor to talk with a very inspiring and intelligent man. At the age of 18 he started his own business, a former judge for the IFBB and the CEO of the rapid global brand Novo Nutrition. He is Andrew Coulson. Andrew and I discussed about several topics such as the heart of the entrepreneur, overcoming obstacles and finding your true passion that will lead you to your own success. So without further ado, let's begin the interview. Welcome Andrew Colson to the Mind Body Podcast. I'm really excited to have you here on my show. And so for all the people that might don't know who is Andrew Colson, please uh, introduce yourself who you are and what you do. Thank you, everybody. I'm the, um, for my sins now, <laughs> I'm founder of Nova Nutrition, which is, I believe, one of the fastest growing uh, functional food protein brands in the world. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about your background? Like, how uh, did you start uh, getting into this fitness industry? What made you so, like, uh, maybe obsessed about being in this particular industry? No, it starts, it starts going back from a very early child, actually. Um, my parents, my mother is Greek, so when I first went to school, um, I was dark-skinned, so I was bullied. Really? So at the age of 13 to 14, I was sick of getting bullied as the skin. Mm-hmm. And this, this, this got me going to the gym, and that was that was the first trigger point of actually being of any interest to to what you call the gym industry, I call it the gym industry, yeah, or the health industry. So it was it was through bullying. So everything happens for a reason. It's it's really like uh, interesting because there's a lot of uh, I think uh, Lou Ferrigno as well was bullied or he was really shy at the beginning. So a lot of uh, bodybuilders and people that uh, get into fitness, it's because they're being bullied. Do you think it's actually made you more uh, confident after you build that body? Um, for a man, of course, it does, but it even goes further back from that. Um, my confidence didn't come from going from the gym. It's just not nice being beaten up at school. <laughs> the, com- the confidence... Um, and the belief that I could do something came at a very early age, actually, at about eight, um, when my father, when he had a nervous breakdown, and uh, and what happened then was we were forced to open a sandwich shop. My mother was forced to open a very small sandwich shop, and I had to get up about four or five o'clock in the morning, eight years old, go to the sandwich shop, get the bus back to school. So at the age of eight, I was forced into this. You, you just got to do it. You, you, you just got to do it. So by the age of nine and ten, I was I was dealing with. Even though you're in a, in a, in a takeaway shop environment, you've got this. It built that drive into me, and it came. So it came from eight. At the age of eight years old, I was leaving home at four or five with my mother, mm-hmm. <laughs> working at the shop. And then going back to school, saying I was sick or whatever, and then working on Saturdays and Sundays, and that's what we had to do to survive. And uh, as a teenager, what made you like? Uh, did you know what you want to do in your life, or you were like you didn't really know back then? No, by by the age of thirteen, I made the decision I was going to be a millionaire at twenty-five. Oh, well, at I the age of thirteen. At the age of thirteen, I made that decision. So I didn't take school too seriously and it wasn't arrogance um i had this attitude of how is history going to help me how is geography going to help me how is physics going to help me yeah so i'm quite good with with maths and communication so to me it was like 
Oh, I can't go to school, but it's, it's always too early. It's, it's, it's not the right time. If anybody's listening out there, it is not the right attitude to take. And I can remember when I was 13, my father said to me, Andrew, you're the lowest in the school. The lowest grade. Mm -hmm. Special needs, he said. And at that point, I thought, shit. <laughs> I'm not one of these. So, so in one year, I then became the top of the school. It wasn't that I, I, I wasn't wanting to learn. I, just didn't, I didn't think I needed it. It was, it was, I built up so much confidence in me from such an early age. I've been forced to do stuff that almost going to a history class was like, I've, I've lived through all of this. And why do I need to learn, learn about you know, the Queen of England? It's not going to benefit me. At that age, I was even thinking, history is not going to benefit me in the commercial world whatsoever. I'm not saying it's the right thing, but that's, that's what was instilled to me at a very early age. So, so then what did you do different? than most people in your age back then, that made you do the shift and uh, made every dream you had back then now become your reality? Well, even though I became the top of the school, <laughs> um, I was still only doing it part-time. So at the age of 15, I was um, playing table tennis with the older boys. And in, in, in that age, you had different levels of examination. So you had all levels that you took at so 15, 16, and you had A levels that you took at 18. And I was playing table tennis when I was supposed to be in the class, and I saw an advertisement for a job. And the, ad the advertisement was for a commodity stockbroker dealing in the textile industry with um, also uh, lots of different commodities. And, and the stipulations for the job was very clear. You had to be 18, two A levels, and to speak one foreign language. And I thought, well, oh, I'll go for the job. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was 15, I'd not even taken the first level of them, and I couldn't speak another language. <laughs> so I went for the job. All the guys in the interview there, they were 18, they had suits and ties on, you know, they were yeah. really smart. And everything, and I went in my school uniform, just with that little tie, just, just tied upside down. And then I thought, oh, shit, like, what, what have I done? <laughs> um, so I got the first, went through the first interview. I got invited for a second interview, and then two or three days later, my father, I remember, I remember him clearly shouting, shouting upstairs, he says, Andy come down. And when he spoke like that, I, I knew he was in the shit. Mm -hmm. And he, he had this letter. He says, what's this? And I said, uh, have I got the job? Mm -hmm. He says, yeah, you've got the job. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Your requirements are two air levels, and you've got to be 18, and you need to speak foreign language. I said, you know, don't bother, they won't know my age. I'll learn the job. I'll learn the job faster. <laughs> They'll find out if you your national insurance number. So I phoned the company up, and they said, congratulations on the job. I said, I need to come to see you. I need to speak to you about something <laughs> quite important. So the gentleman concerned said, what's, what's the problem? I said, well, on what basis? And it sounds very arrogant, this, but it wasn't. I thought about what to say. He says, on what? I said, on what basis did you give me the job? He says, and they looked at me quite puzzled. Yeah. I said, well, it's not on the exam results because I've not taken them. Because the, the higher exam results were to follow. Mm -hmm. So I said, it can't be based upon that. And you've asked me to speak French. So on what basis did you give me the job? I said, the interview, right? And I said, of course the interview. I said, well, what about if we give you an offer? <laughs> and I remember at the time the wage was 40 pounds per week. 
45. I said, yeah. And was it per week or per month? So I said to them, it's a five year training program to, to work in the stocks and shares and qualities. What about if I said to you, I would do this in three in, by the age of 18? And they said, it's impossible, you're 18 soon. I said, well, well that's the thing. I'm not 18, I'm 15, mm. but I'll be two years faster. But I'll work for you for 32 pounds. Mm. So it's a win-win situation for you. You've got the job, <laughs> you've got the person you want, and I'm giving to you eight pounds uh, a week less. And they were like, okay, <laughs> when can you start? Mm. So I, I did my exam, I passed all my exams. It was something like June the 3rd, 17th, and, and I started work. And that was the Friday, and I started work on the, on the Monday. At the same time you've been a student? The day after I finished my studies, I went straight to work. So so after you finished school? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, w when uh, y I, you said like you had a time in your life that uh, stuff didn't go really well for you, maybe financially. Can you uh, take us uh, back then? Well, from, from, from that career, I accelerated back quite fast and got, I, got, I got bored with that. I then moved to another another job and then I moved next door but one to a packaging designer. He designed food packaging. And I thought when I was speaking to him, my job was far more difficult than his job. So I said to him, you know, why don't we set up a design company, branding communication company? So he said to me, what? You don't know anything about packaging. I said, I don't need to know anything about packaging. Let's just do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was 19 and a half, 20 now. So that's when I set up my first business. But I knew nothing about the industry, about packaging. All I knew was that packaging designers knew how to design packaging, but they didn't know how to communicate and sell. So that business started and it was an accelerated growth to the point when it was 20 pounds. I was young business, young business for a year. You have all the choppings, you have the Porsches, you've got the Ferraris, you you live in the dream, yeah? What the perceived dream. And then at the age of 24, uh, what happened was there was a financial crisis in the UK. I was doing I was selling my company two weeks later uh, for quite a lot of money. I won't say the figure, but it was like lottery money. Mm -hmm. And um, the banks called one day and said, um, we're going to reduce your own bill. So we went down to the bank and we, we got some more money in, put it into the overdraft, and they cut the overdraft again. It was basically the technical media and so on. So, from looking to, in 10 days, get a lot of money, lots of money, um, I went from zero to zero. Because the banks, I took that company to a point, and uh, through acquisitions, where the banks were not, were not at risk. And as soon as they got out of risk, they, they, they withdrew the old account. What went in your head back then? What did you think? What is the phrases you tell yourself? When you that in that moment, when you go from everything to zero, what do you take yourself? I thought, no, I thought, fuck you, this is not going, this is not going to stop. So mm -hmm. I um, tried to um, do a deal with the receiver, and I bought my own company back. And then that took three days of negotiations with no sleep. And then just before I signed the papers, the senior, the old senior management came to my office. And I said, you know what, Andrew, we think we deserve a share of this business. And I went, fuck you. And I got my bags, I got my boxes, I put in a thing. And I said, the problem with your company before is it was run by too many people. Fuck off, I'm gone. And I put, my, I put a cardboard box in the back of the box and drove home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> 
It's amazing. What What is something you believe that other people think is insane? Pardon? What is something you believe that other people think is insane? Insane about me or insane about in insane general? about in general in life because you gotta be insane if you want to achieve more, right? You can't think like anybody else. You can't think like anybody else, and you've almost got to have psychopathic traits. Um, not not nasty psychopathic traits, but you've got to um, be so focused that um, it, 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 it. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't it doesn't leave actually to 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 a happy life because you're so driven to achieve something, and you're not going to quit. So the more knocks I go off, you know, for eight. I'm 15, and the business went bust. That just like made me even more determined. I was like even more determined then. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I had a son, and he was uh, he was one year old. So I went back dealing on, on the uh, on the stock market. Um, and I'm still very close to his mother. He's in fact all all the credit to his mother because she's brought my son up. And my son's up. Uh, the greatest guy in the world. But I can remember that to this day, because I must have gone a bit crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm okay, but I'm not okay. I've gone a bit crazy. I've just lost 11 million pounds. I've gone from here to zero and I've got no cars. I've got no pounds. I remember getting into the car. We were moving house and she says, um, where are you going? Wait, what? what do you mean, where am I going? She sure, we're finished. Hmm. So I gave my son a kiss goodbye, and I walked to my mother's house, which was about six miles, and I said, I need somewhere to sleep. And that was uh, 25 years old. And she, you know, she's, my mother, she said, well, you've got nowhere to sleep. I said, what about my spare bedroom? She went, your brother's doing a business. I said, what's he doing? I said, my brother's, he's not that, he's not that. She said he's standing in his underwear. Mm. So I walked into my old bedroom and I could see nothing. All I could see was a bed. Underwear. I couldn't even put a bed there. So I just slept on the floor and above my head, six inches, was women's underwear. So then I, the only choice I had then was to go back into packaging design. You know, design of brands. And so I started then from my uh, mother's kitchen the very next day. There was no way to survive. I contacted two of the designers that worked for me and it gradually built up, it built up, it built up. And I eventually sold that company. Did you ever, uh, in any time, like when, when life didn't give you any evidence, did you feel like you want to quit? No, it's, 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 it's not arrogance. Um, you, you do get a sense of, um, Letting other people down, but I never, I never thought that I would ever quit. Because of it's just, it's just, no, it's just, it's just not me, my nature. It's just um, there was a certain certain point where I couldn't live, couldn't live there, and there wasn't anywhere to live, and that was a difficult period. But then I eventually uh, found um, a gym, and I slept in the gym for a bit there. So technically, I was homeless there. For a period of time, but even at that point, it was you know, I was still working on my design business, you know, doing it, doing it from the the floor, you know, to working in the gym and doing it in the um, aerobics room. Do you have any quote you live your life by? I mean, the the greatest. The greatest uh, achievement that I've had in my life is that is for my son to say that he was proud of. He's proud of me. I don't really focus on quote, quotes and quotes in my life. And I respect what other people have done, but I don't worship them. Because mm -hmm. there's huge businessmen out there. But I'm not one of these people that worship them or follow what they do. Um, I'm just. Uh, You've got to be a visionary. 
you know, if you, it, and, and the, the, they talk, they've got this cliche stuff you see on all social media, the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, what is there to fear? All you're fearing is the opinion of others. Okay? Because if you're investing £1,000 or $2,000 or nothing, okay, some businesses don't take anything to get off the ground if you've got passion. But the fear of failure is nothing to do with, with, with you. It's to do with your ego. It's to do with other people thinking you failed. Oh, look, I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you couldn't do it. So it's the opinion of others that stops people from doing it. And that's their own ego. There's lots of people who want to do something, but they don't do it and they always too risky. Fuck risk. Mm -hmm. It's not risky. It's because their self-confidence will not let them look like they failed to, to their friends. Well, if their friends criticize them for failing, then they're not friends, right? Yes. So why give them any opinion? Why give them any attention? You've got one shot in this life. One shot. And you've got to give it absolutely your very best. You know, from the morning to night, it made every minute count. You just got one shot. You know, people say that, you know, in a generalization form. But the, but the truth is, you only have one shot. What we spoke about five minutes ago is gone. That's history. Mm -hmm. We're living in this moment, right here, right now. So if some people say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. <laughs> Full of shit. Why not now? Why not take the risk? I mean, in fact, what risk is that? Ego. Ego, your own ego, because it's, it's, it's certainly not, it's certainly nothing, nothing but it's, it's your fear of what the people think about you. They stop you from doing what you want to do. That's the truth about it. It's your fear of their opinion of you. Yes. And if there were, if there were friends anyway, who gives a shit? So how, how can you get out of this mentality, like fear of money or like a lot of people have a, have a lot of kind of fear. So how is it for you that you overcome all of these doubts or fears? I generally, truly do not give a shit about people's opinion of me. It's I'm something that uh, like you said to yourself since you were in the young age? You've got to feel struggle. <laughs> You've got to struggle to understand, to fight back. Um, of course, of course, I value the opinion of close friends. And a friend is a very generalized use term that, that, you know, friends, if you can count more than two or three friends, you're very lucky. Okay? But, but um, I've never feared not doing anything. Never feared taking a risk, and I've um, I've never doubted myself. I've never failed. I've learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they say there is there is no failure unless you learn something. If you don't I, learn, then I'm, I'm a true believer that everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And when I look back on things that have happened to me in life, that well, was a disaster, disaster at eight, disaster at twenty-four. Um, well, if I didn't. If I didn't stop doing what I was doing at 24, I wouldn't have um, had to have been homeless and had no house. Okay? That would have then not got me going back to the gym again. That would have not got me back into design work. And then the passion for the gym came back more and more. So everything happens for a reason. But when you look back, it's a disaster. But back then, it was a disaster for you? Like the word that you said, or you said, like, oh my God. What is this disaster, or what? What did you I say back then? People think it's disaster. It's not. It's, it's, it's a blip. But what it's did you blip. think? What What is the word that you used back then to describe this uh, this current thing that happened? I think in the back of my head, I think I'm saying to myself, "Fuck you! This is not me to you. Fuck you! This is not me to you. Fuck you! This is not me to you." This is not what? <laughs> like fuck you! This is not me to you. This is not happening to you. This is not happening to you. All right. This is not you. Mm -hmm. 
And I think subconscious that's what goes through my yeah. Because this is a lot of uh, the phrases we sell to ourselves, we hypnotize ourselves, we do incantations, and we say something with emotion, and you said like, fuck you, this is not you, fuck you, this is not you, and you said it so much time that you believe, no, this is not me, this, something's gotta change. And a lot of people just say like, oh my god, oh my god, why did this happen to me, why? So, the brain is like a computer, <clears throat> why is happened to you, because you did this and you screwed this, so you had a better meaning. And people overthink things. Mm -hmm. They overthink things way too much. Um, you know, if you can't change it, why worry about it? Yeah. What's what's we going to do about your situation? Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do this. I understand people in difficult situations, but if you can't change that particular situation, if the mindset is positive. I guarantee you the following day you will be in a better situation. So everything revolves around the mind. Mm -hmm. Everything you control your mind, you can control anything you want to do. What advice would you give to your uh, maybe 20, 25 or 30 year old self? And uh, yeah, what, what would you say to this guy, this Andrew, if you see him? <laughs> Funny enough, my man who works for me is my nephew, he's 28, and I'm seeing a very similar traits to him, in him, in him. Um, I, would, I would have just said, uh, actually I probably wouldn't have said anything, because you know what, I wouldn't have listened. Mm. I wouldn't have listened. You could have said anything to me in the world, trust me. And you could have been talking to me, and this, 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 and it's called dopamine, okay? Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are addicted, they're an, they're an addict to dopamine, okay? which is a self-creating drug that makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. And if, if your passion is to achieve something, whatever that might be, basketball player, football player, you know, doing normal nutrition, if your passion is that, then the highest level of dopamine, the highest, the highest adrenaline push you're going to get is when you're talking about that. Right? And unfortunately, you can start to talk to me about the main way the fight was going to be going on. In the back of my mind, I'm, I look like I'm listening to you, but I'm really not. Because mm -hmm. it's not me what, what I mean. Now, if you start talking to me about business, I get a rush. Mm -hmm. So most entrepreneurs, they're actually addicts to dopamine. And that dopamine comes from the passion. And the passion is the business. And they're like, uh, just, they're not living uh, like in, in a world that's constantly try to put stuff in your head, right? Like Instagram, Facebook, all of that stuff. Uh, like you said, the fight, like Floyd made, they're like, for me as well, it's like, I didn't know about the fight just like a couple of days ago. Because when you're so into what you're doing, then you are blocking everything around you. You don't see, you don't have like weekends, you don't you don't know what day today is. It's like you are so into what you're doing that you're like, I didn't know there is a hurricane in Houston. <laughs> so so you're like so into what you do. Unfortunately, it's a, it takes a certain type of breed of person. Um, and, but I do believe anybody can anybody can achieve any level of success. A anybody can achieve something if they put their mind to it. But the extremist entrepreneur, the extremist, um, it's their life. And I don't care what anybody else says. I mean, you know, some people say that, you know, they can get, get balance. But the minute they retire or the minute they sell for 100 million or 50 million, they get old and, 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 and they want to go back to work. It's just in it's just in your blood because that's what's that's what's made them happy. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying that's a balanced lifestyle, but I am saying that's what very driven people are not. Mm -hmm. I believe they're so focused on achieving something, wherever that might be. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of there's lots of skilled footballers out there, but the one that stays out the longest and practices and never stops, and never stops, and never stops, and never stops. He's the one that gets there. Yes. So it's in all walks of life. Can you take us uh, to
to your morning ritual like what is your first 60 minutes of the day look like when you wake up <laughs> you serious you want to answer that question yes <laughs> as soon as I wake up I wake up about 3 or 4 times a day answering emails from then when I wake up about 5 o'clock the first thing I do is answer my emails from my bed really? it doesn't make you like uh, crazy in the head? I wake up and I straight to my emails really? Yeah, straight to my emails or straight to the email before I get up. Do you feel it makes yeah. your, your day more stressful if you start it like this? But I'm just telling you, it's not stressful, is it? Because that's what I'm doing. Uh, it doesn't, it's like make you calm when you, you do it's this? It's not stressful. I'm, 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 living, I'm living what I want to live. Hmm. So some people say, okay, take time out and have some breakfast. And, you know, do this. That suits some people. And it's probably a more balanced life, but no question be a more balanced life. But whilst I'm eating my breakfast, I'm not enjoying my breakfast because I've got, I know I've got some emails to use what to. Mm -hmm. And I've got a real model. I answer emails in five minutes. My response to three emails is five minutes. In fact, if to jump on an airplane, I'll, I'll, my phone gets turned on. To, so for the, going back to the original question, um, I stay in bed for I would like to answer tons of some emails. Um, I'm speaking from my home office. Yeah, <laughs> this is the gospel too. I come downstairs. I put the shower on. I come to this computer. I do some more emails. I have a shower. I get changed. I have my breakfast. I get to work as fast as possible and straight to work. So from the second I open my eyes, I open my phone before my curtains. Mm. <laughs> And that's what you've got to do. <laughs> Maybe it's not what you've got to do. But you ask, you ask me on this honest opinion. Yes, yes, of course. And that's, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you take us to your uh, brand, uh, Protein Bites? Can you tell us how it began, maybe a little bit uh, in a short version, and uh, what's the brand vision? No, the, the, of course. I became an IFBB judge, so I got not very quite knowledgeable about protein. Um, and before, before, uh, before Nova Nutrition very quickly, I did a, a business called Body Coaches that nobody knows about. And I spent four years doing that at this desk, four years. And that was a, an online training seminar um, podcast before Facebook did all this thing. And so. There was all top athletes, and, and they were to they could answer questions to their fans. Like, I spent four years um, doing that, and that broke me as well financially, to the point. And in that draw, there were two mobile phones, and I, I had to go down to town and sell them just to eat one weekend. Um, but I wasn't going to quit. There's no way I was going to quit. Right? And then. Around the same time, I was thinking, like, no, I should launch a protein band. Everybody, everybody thinks I'm going to launch a protein band. But for, I don't do what other people do. It's like, you just compete in the surveys at the bottom. So I thought, well, where's the next trend going to be? Where, where, where can I see the next trend going to be? And the next trend was obviously going to be functional protein for, for mainstream people. And they don't want to eat, drink protein, so, you know, they, they don't want to have average protein bars. So I thought of making a protein chip, Chris. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how that came about. And um, the first ones I would make were terrible to eat. But, but, but we, we, we evolved, and we're, with a big, we're the biggest producer in the world of protein chips now. Um, so it, again, it wasn't doing what other people are doing. Think, see a vision, see a gap. And if it's something new and innovative and it's competitive, um, and the vision was always to take protein to mass market, always to put protein into the masses. And people always want to eat healthy, but they want, they want sacrifice taste. So the vision of Nova Nutrition was always to put protein into food instead of protein companies trying to make themselves look like food companies.
Mm-hmm. And they're never going to do that because people don't want to look like, um, you know, a woman's not going to be sitting there with a big protein tub on a kitchen table. But she would eat maybe a protein wafer or a, she would eat a protein cereal. So it's always to put protein into foods that people eat already. Mm. Then they're not buying a separate product. They're doing this, they're doing the same purchase and just switching the purchase for a different product. Because if you're in the if you're in the shopping basket, then you imagine you're going on the supermarket and you're in this bored mode and you, the mum's pushing the trolley and you're on autopilot and the kids going crazy. The last thing people do is buy new products. They may buy alternatives to what they currently buy. That's called brand switching. Mm-hmm. So my idea was always to put protein into food that people are always eating. Therefore, they just have to brand switch. Mm-hmm. They don't have to buy an additional purchase. Yeah. But people lose sight of the fact that most people only spend £50 or £100 a week on grocery. If they're lucky. And they expect them to go to a supermarket now and buy a protein chip. Mm-hmm. Financial disaster. Yeah. So it was almost to make it accessible to Max and to the average person. So, so back then when you just started, it, like, it was just you or you already built a company with uh, more people? Because how can you influence other people and start your own business and build it to a big brand that is a worldwide? No, what, what actually happened was I, because of the body coach that I'm very fortunate very connected to the IFBB, mm-hmm. I took I developed the protein chips called protein bites that's down there, yeah? Mm-hmm. They weren't like that, just they were just foil bags, foil bags, just little, little box. And I went to FIBO in Germany. But I showed it to all the bodybuilders. I showed it to even my friend Ronnie Coleman, Dorian Yates, people like that. And they all said, oh, nobody, nobody, nobody will eat. Why does anybody want to eat a protein chip? Mm-hmm. You've got protein bars. I thought, fuck you. <laughs> so, again, the same attitude. I came straight home. I printed, and all of this is very evident on social media. People look on my Facebook. Um, I developed the product more and designed the packs, made some, made some packs, borrowed risky money. Like I had no money, and I was doing the body coaches stand. I was committed to body coaches. And the side of the body coach stand, a place in an ex- exhibition in the UK, I put some protein chips there, protein bags. Mm-hmm. It was like nobody was interested in body coaches. It was protein. Mm-hmm. So, so the two things when people said don't do it, mm-hmm. that's just not happening in my world. Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're thinking inside the box. Yes. They're thinking, look what's here. Everybody's busy eating protein bars. Everybody's busy eating ready drinks. Everybody's drinking protein chips. Why would somebody want something different? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the very point. People do want something different. And that's the mind of the yeah. entrepreneur, right? It's like you always see an opportunity, just like you said. You take something and you see, okay, how can I use this to my advantage? It's a very operative way of saying, yeah, how can I use that to my advantage? Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, so that's, that, that's how I first launched it in, in May, an exhibition, and then it just exploded from there, really. And we were, in the first year, in about 30 or 40 countries. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> but it was a poor, poor, but upon reflection, it was a poor product. Um, but it's, 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 it's totally different now. Um, selling something that's new and innovative and tasty is far easier than selling something else that somebody else is doing. So, um, and then I use the power of Instagram to create the perception um, of the size of the company. And people are like sheep. Um, but it was a good product. Developed it on this good point. But I always knew it was the stepping stone. I always knew that making a budget cheaper than the stepping stone. Because immediately big competitors started to compete against me, which was much bigger than me. So the way to overcome that is you always have a second evolution of the product. So they're copying your they're copying your current product. Okay? Mm-hmm. What I advise anybody to do is always have a, 
the better product behind the scenes. Because they're copying this. Right? When they copy this, I'm going to launch this. So they're copying me, they're going to match me for test. I'm going to say, don't worry, here we go, your product. <laughs> Try again. Um, and that was the strategy on the protein tubes. And where do and you then, see like a this company build up on like let's say five years from now? Do you see yourself dominate the industry like uh, you know Crest bars did really well at the past uh, three to five years and they made it uh, into a billion dollar company? They were the first company to copy me with a protein chip, mm -hmm. and that was a, that 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 was really my breakthrough because they focused all upon macros. Nutritional facts. Mm -hmm. They didn't focus on test, and and I was a small company based in England. No doing a quest. Soon they launched, and they said they were the first maker of a protein chip. Mm -hmm. My social media went crazy. It's like so. What they did was they actually did me a massive favor. The 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 day the day that quest launched the protein chip was like shit. Like I said to you before, because that was the reason, right? Mm -hmm. So at that time, it's like, shit, that's the most protein chip. But look what happens. No disrespect to Quest. <laughs> and I know that Quest. It's not a good chip. Mm -hmm. So what they ever did was they thought, there's a protein chip in the world. I said, well, we don't like that one. And then they Googled and then they found Michael. Mm -hmm. So Quest actually. <laughs> Helped me. Brand you know, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, thank you, Quest. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not, that's not, you know, you've got to give respect to Quest for what they've done because they were the real people that um, made protein accessible to the masses mm -hmm. um, with protein bar. With a protein bar that was very, very difficult to eat, didn't taste actually that great, and they marketed it so you could put it into a microwave. That's clever. Mm -hmm. That's not very convenient if you've got to put that into a microwave. Yes. But it will tell you. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more, there's a lot more that goes behind the scenes than, than we see now. So, uh, last question uh, is I always love to ask uh, the people that I interview is what is the legacy you would like to live long after you won't be here in this world? Next yeah, we're all going to die, right? Hmm? Um, we're all going to die. Because that, that's that's a good given fact. Yes. What, what legacy would I like to leave? Um, that you, that um, first of all, I want my son to be proud of me. That's that's the first thing. That, that's my priority. Um, and if I was to say I was to leave a legacy, my family was to say, all oh, people knew me. It was like. He was just relentless. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to work out on me. I don't want anybody to um, not fight back as much as I've done. It's, it, for me, it's like it's a fight, yeah. And so I suppose you know, look at him. Well, he never did quit. And he had a lot of setbacks, and he fought back. It's like, what the fuck? How did you do that? Well, actually, if you break it right down, it's very simple. You just got to believe in yourself. You just got to believe in yourself. Um, and how do you define success? How do you define success? Success, the, the, the definition of success is, 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 is has to be doing what you love. And that, that, has, that has no monetary value. So, you know, somebody who is, you know, if they live in a very modest household, is very happily, happily married, they have achieved success, right? Mm -hmm. If they make a monument to normal affairs, that, that's their success. So, my definition of success is for you, is if you're doing what you love. And, and you, don't have to, you don't have to harm people in the way to. If I said success to you, like, who is the first person that comes in mind to you? And why? 
first. I say like success. What what is the first person that comes into your mind? Maybe yourself. Jobs. Apple. Why? Because he never quit, did he? And everything happened for a reason. He got his idea stolen from him. He he was I mean, I'm not comparing myself to him at all. Please don't get me wrong. But if you think about it, he didn't like school. He was doing with some hippies. He was doing, you know, smoking pot with hippies, which is how he learned how to um, uh, do type uh, right properly. So that's how he got the idea of, of, a, of an Apple Macintosh because a computer that didn't just have this static typography. So everything happens for a reason. And then when he then when he got sacked from Apple, he got sacked from his own company. Can you imagine how that he? He's the you know, entrepreneur in the world. He's like world leading. He's in you know, actual fact his platform got stolen by um, Gates. So in a setback there, that got stolen. He fought back. And then when he got sacked from his own company, when he got sacked from his very own company, marched out. He went back to doing what he loved. Mm-hmm. He went back to doing what he loved. He found his purpose, and then he built those companies up, and then those companies were bought by Apple, and he then became back the CEO of Apple. So he's probably the man that I most most respect. And the the main thing is because just like you said, because he did what he loved, and this is how you define success. He did. He did what he loved. It's one of the most powerful speeches I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. I went to Harvard University to do a speech and then went to Harvard University. Yeah, that was a great speech. It was a great speech. Mm-hmm. But in, 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 if I was to say to anybody, just watch one, one video, YouTube video, it would be that. Because you've got to find your purpose. Because you will not, you will not achieve success for money if you're looking for money. You will not do it for money, trust me. You have red eyes like this. I slept three hours last night. If you, you do it for money, mm-hmm. you do it for the passion. And, and and if the money comes, it comes. And people say, oh, I can't do it because I've got no money. Well, if, if somebody else sees you with that passion, I guarantee they'll give you money. So that's bullshit too. I can't do it because I've got no money. I can't do it because I've got no business. Bullshit. Go pictures. Go pitch to people money. They'll pitch it to someone like me. Mm. If I see someone with passion, if I see someone with passion, it doesn't matter what they do, I'll employ them. I'll employ them because because if they want passion, with passion you can learn anything. If you believe in yourself and you've got passion, you can learn anything in this world. Anything. I don't believe you have to have your qualifications to do it to be an entrepreneur. So I surround myself my employees, the one common factor in all of them is the no passion. No passion, no success. That's it. I think this is what we're, I'm going to put in the in the line of this interview. No passion, no success. <laughs> it's the truth. It's yeah. the truth, though. It you know, is, it is. You know, I'm going to go back to work. It's the truth. No passion, no success. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You could say no, no passion, no life. Mm-hmm. So it's all about passion. Because if you don't have any passion about anything, what are you doing on this planet? Yes, and this is where most of the people find themselves, and it's just make them miserable. This is why they all uh, uh, criticize and talk shit about other people because they're not living how they want to be. I'll tell you very, very quickly. I'll tell you a funny story. When I was when I was all stressed, and I was like 22, 23, and I was vomiting every morning. My own draft was seven million, and I was about to sell this company. I was literally vomiting every single morning with stress. And I went to Cyprus to, uh, for to escape for holiday. And people like me actually get sick when you go on holiday for about two, three days. For sure, the stress it's like suddenly it's like, well, what's good? What's up? Where's my phone? No. So, and there was this guy, he had, um, he was walking on the beach, little Greek guy, he was going, watermelon, 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 
Walked to Bella, everybody was walked to Bella. And he was smiling from the morning to the night. Morning to the night. And I said to him, I always asked, I'm always, I always, I always ask, excuse me, I said, why are you so happy? Yeah, why are you so happy? I've never seen you not smile. You're always smiling. He says, you come here for two weeks for a holiday to paradise. I live in paradise. Mm. The only thing I have to worry about is if I've got enough watermelons to sell. Mm. He was successful, right? Yeah. He was doing what I loved. So when people say, you know, the dog women, what they've got to do, I've got to, this is my job. No, it's not, you don't have to do that. The stuff is stopping you. You could go be this man selling the watermelons if you want to. It's not going to cost you any money. It's going to cost you very little money to live and you've got no stress. And so if people complain about stress, remember. I think it's a lot of uh, where you live internally. It's like habits. If you always stress yourself or you are habitually got into stress or you're always hungry, so you always look for what makes you upset, right? But if you're constantly more happy, smiling more, then it becomes an habit to smile more. But po po you have to have a positive mindset. You have to have a positive mindset. Even, even in, in the most darkest periods, you know, you can, you can say, to, well, it can't get any worse. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, what can I do about it? And I guarantee people this, if, if, if they can control the mind and say, do you know what? It is what it is. Okay? I can't even cheat. Let's, let's say there's a problem. You give me a problem now. I can't resolve it until Monday or for three days. Trust me, I will not worry about that until Monday. Mm -hmm. Because I can't do anything about it. So she can just destroy the next two or three days. I may as well put my mind productively, positively, and focus that positive energy into it. So then I'll come back to your home on Monday. And then it's less of a problem. I've not made it a much bigger problem yes. by worrying for three days. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a journey, it's a journey, it's a journey. So where can we find you on the site, the social media? I try to avoid social media. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nova Nutrition is, uh, is all, all of about social media. Um, it's on Instagram. Um, I'm Andre Colson on Instagram. But I still go to the gym. And, and I go to the gym for one reason. People say to me, why do you even go to the gym? Why do you post training videos on this show? You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't need the money. No, I don't need the money. But do you know why I do it? Right. I'll tell you what I'm doing. Without the gym, there would be no over nutrition. So if I can help one person right, learn how to train properly from the gym, then I've done my job. I've given back. I've given back to the root that got me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. And that's what people forget to do too. So that's why I do my training videos on Instagram. The other thing that's very, very important in life is, is, is being with like-minded people. Because you are what you become and you are. We are what we think, we are what we do, we are what we eat. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the creatures of habit. So if you're surrounded by people who are very comfortable, um, they're living in a comfort zone. Trust me, you're the best in the comfort zone. You know, uh, human beings that have uh, habitual people, if, if, you, if you're surrounded by it, what's happened to me in my real life? My best friend had a stomach, he, he, he couldn't speak properly. Mm. After three or four months, I started to pick up this habit. Really? Yeah, I did, yeah. It's possible too. I started to pick up this habit. And it's very important to surround yourself with like-minded people and distance yourself from negative energy, right? Even your so, family? Yes. Now, your family is your family. You may be able to listen to them, but let it go in one ear and you go straight out the other. <laughs> Just, but that, that's the truth. That's the truth about it. Because yes. you're not going to stop negative. You're not going to stop negative energy. That's impossible. The world loves negative energy, yeah? 
But it's up to you whether you let it stay or go out. Mm. That's very important, that. So you are, you are who you, are, you, who you associate with, with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be successful, you don't have to be surrounded by successful people, but surround yourself with positive people. Yeah? Yes. You know, if you, if you, if you want to go on a slippery slope, start going to clubs, you don't take any drugs. You start going to clubs, I guarantee you'll start taking drugs. Humans are creatures of habit. So it's very, very important that you're not going to stop the negative vibes. You're not going to stop the critics. Right? And one of one, a wonderful thing about critics is they can teach you a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And let me explain upon that. A critic will criticize you. A critic will criticize your product. A critic will criticize your service. If you're a lawyer, for example, yeah. If you're an interviewer, yeah. If you've got a brand, a critic will criticize my product. A critic will criticize how it tastes. Use it. Yes, great. Use their criticism because they are the consumer. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the critic and use their what they think is negative energy to flip it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this, is this, is this. Use it. Listen to the critic. People say don't listen to the critics. I say bullshit. Mm -hmm. I say listen to the critic. Because the critic very often actually is right. So listen to the critic, because that's the general population. In your brain, put it all together, or they criticize it, make it better. Make yourself better. And it keeps constantly improving. Mm -hmm. So listen to the critic. Don't let it affect your positive mindset, but the critic is very is, is keen. Because the person that thinks they know they know everything, they will fall. They will fall. You've got to listen to the public, which is generally the critics. Really? Use the energy. Use the critics' energy and improve yourself, improve your products, improve your interview techniques. Improve your building if you're a builder. If people criticize you, they'll criticize you for a reason. If something's perfect, there's nothing to criticize, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing to criticize, something's perfect. So, of course, there must be something to criticize. So, I'm not saying it's all it's a generalization, but use the critic's voice to improve your product, to improve how you come across. And just to improve your general approach to life and your communication skills. So, critics are fantastic if you use them properly. Yeah, I, I love the, the how you you interrupt it in your head. Like yesterday, I, I heard the audio book of uh, Tony about uh, the power of uh, of language because the the language we use it actually becomes our experience and you say like critics are fantastic and if you take fantastic it's like make a different meaning just critics are our good right it's like fantastic and the mean like you have for world fantastic can automatically make you more emotional to it right it's like yeah, uh, you see how I go. Fantastic. yeah what you see how your body is changing like fantastic yeah. <laughs> so so it's it's great. Like uh, we can always uh, create a better meaning to everything that happens to us if we use different phrases, we use different words. So it's it's make a different experience in our head. Yeah, just it's it's it's, it's a word, right? Yeah. Amazing. So thank you very very much for the the time that you spent with me and uh, talking to me. It was really an honor and pleasure to talk to you. You're a uh, very interesting man and uh, I learned a lot from you. So I thank you very much for the time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who eats my products. And uh, uh, I'll go back to that quote. No passion, no success. If you enjoyed this interview or any other one from the Mind Body podcast, 
feel free to subscribe to my podcast at iTunes, SoundCloud, and at my YouTube channel. Also, feel free to share or leave a message at the comments below because your opinion is really important to me. Just like I always say, leaders create leaders and we all here to grow together. For more information about fat loss, gaining muscle and taking your mind to a whole new level, check my site at www.lidodayan.com. Till then, never, ever forget to smile. See you soon.